Every year, one thing is always predictable. Postage costs go up. Stamps.com gives you crazy discounts for up to 89% off USPS and UPS services, so your business will barely notice the change. Stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses just like yours. It's like your own personal post office. No lines, no traffic, no waiting. Sign up with promo code PROGRAM for a four-week trial, plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. That's Stamps.com code PROGRAM. Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on ChumbaCasino.com. I looked over the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino-style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's ChumbaCasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. VTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. Welcome to Back to the Frame Rate, part of the Weston Media Podcast Network. Back to the Frame Rate, where we watch and discuss films on VOD and streaming platforms for your entertainment. I'm your host, Nathan Schur, and I'm here with Ellie Escobar, Sam Cole, and Brianna Butterworth. Welcome Hello. back, everyone. Hey. <laughs> How, How are is- you? <laughs> How is everybody? I'm just Andy. Not bad. I'm Not great. bad. Can't complain. <laughs> Can't complain over here. Everyone have a great week, I hope. Oh, yeah. It's pretty good. It's only Monday. All right. Good. Good. Just getting too dark too quickly. Sunday was incredible. It was fine. It was good. It gets gets dark now at 30. I don't like it when this happens. And our bodies have not adjusted yet to this. uh, Uh, Nope. I don't like it when it happens, but I do like getting that extra hour of – at, when it, when it, at night when it's like 2 a.m. and it goes back to 1 and you're like, yeah, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I, April is the one where, where you gain, where you lose the night hours and it like, you get more light mm-hmm. at the end of the day, but that adjustment for some reason is harder for me. That's My just, problem is yeah. I have a six-year-old who doesn't seem to understand how clocks work and, Ooh, you know, yeah. clocks move back, but in her world... The clocks haven't changed, so she still gets up at some crazy um, early time now. Still, <laughs> doesn't work. All right, so yes, so we are continuing our noir vember, our foray into the world of eighties ne- neo noir. Last week we uh, reviewed American Gigolo, but this week we move ahead one year <laughs> on the calendar. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I know, and we are going to be reviewing Body Heat. And um, Sam, do you have some? Well, you know what? I'm going to start off with the trailer for Body Heat, which, <laughs> if anyone is familiar with the trailer, is uh, I'm not going to play much of this because it's really just some wind chimes and some loud noises. But here it is. <laughs> <laughs> Wait for it. Yeah, I'm going to cut it off there because it's really about two minutes of that. Was that really the trailer? Finally. Yes, it is yes. the worst trailer I've seen. Okay. <laughs> Finally, a movie with something to say. Finally. Yes, I <laughs> searched and searched and searched for any, like, not even just a trailer, but like a TV spot, anything. And there is nothing on YouTube or anywhere on the internet that's wow. anything more. There's, there's interviews, there's all this other stuff, but there's no publicity of any kind of no TV spots at all or other trailers for this other than this very, this little mood piece about uh body. So anyways, that is uh that is the trailer <laughs> a little 20 seconds of it. At least it just goes on and on and on. But before we continue, let's get some movie facts for what we're going to watch. Sam, 
Take it away. Woo-hoo. So the movie that we are discussing this evening is called Body Heat. It came out in 1981. Now, this was Lawrence Kasdan's directorial debut. Uh, and if that name sounds familiar to any of you listeners, Lawrence Kasdan is the screenwriter behind classics such as Raiders of the Lost Ark and The Empire Strikes Back, arguably the best Star Wars movie ever made. I would definitely be in that camp. Also, uh, the best this- Indiana Jones movie, too. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yes. Hey, absolutely. That's true. I, I, I one could not agree more. And uh, Crystal Skull. Are you still thinking Crystal Skull is right there up there? Well, too? Or? The monkey swinging on the vine scenes is what makes Crystal Skull the best. You know what I mean? It's like all that other stuff with the Ark and the Nazis. When Shia LaBeouf swings on the vines, it's like this is number one. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that was that was tough to lie. Anyway, continue, um, Sam. So this movie was actually edited by Carol Littleton, who actually um, edited E.T., uh, the Manchurian Candidate, and uh, Dreamcatcher. The DP was Richard Klein, who had done uh, King Kong, Star Trek, and Breathless. Um, this movie uh, did well. It, it had a budget of nine million, and and it box office grossed worldwide over twenty four million in nineteen eighty one. Uh, this stars William Hurt, Kathleen Turner, Richard Crenna of Rambo fame, uh, Ted Danson, uh, who I'll comment on later because I particularly liked him in this movie, Mickey Rourke and J.A. Preston. Um, a couple things about this movie. Uh, Kazdan actually insisted on casting unknowns in order to give the audience an opportunity to discover the great talent for the very first time. Now, we know all these actors now in the future, uh, but at that time, I could kind of see what he was doing with that. Um, interestingly enough, there was a SAG strike back then that caused delays and it pushed the filming to November, 1980 when Florida was cold and this movie is called body heat. So it was, you know, supposed to be warm. Uh, so the, the crew actually implemented various elements to depict a heat wave, including adding steam, running fans, spraying actors with water and using other visual effects. So movie magic, because you would, you would never know that watching it. Um, and uh, actually, interesting thing about Kathleen Turner, she was actually a waitress at the time trying to afford uh, an apartment in um, L.A. and New York. And once the film wrapped, she asked for her old job back until the movie came out. We all, of course, know now that um, Kathleen Turner, you know, turned out to be a huge star. And so um, there's lots of more takeaways we could discuss, but that's just kind of the gist of it for now. And uh um, to give you uh, one last thing, I'm a big fan of Roger Ebert, and he actually loves this movie. He said, you watch the movie the first time from his point of view and the second time from hers, every scene plays two ways. You agree with that? Body Heat is good enough to make film noir play like we hadn't seen it before. Um, so, yeah, very interesting. And that's just kind of a, a, a gist, a lot more to discuss about the film, but an overview of Body Heat. Thank feel you, Sam. Free to include anything I didn't include because there's a lot of good stuff on this movie. I just uh, I don't want to you know drone on too long, but yeah, no, there is there, there's more a, to say. Yeah, there, there's a lot. I think we'll get into it when we start discussing this. So um, let let's get into it, and I'm gonna turn it right back over to you, Sam. I would love to get your uh, basic initial thoughts on on Body Heat. Sam, would you like to give your review on Body Heat? <laughs> yes, I would, <laughs> Sam. Thank you so much. You're the man. I know. Um, so anyway, uh, my, uh, I actually, I enjoyed this movie. I, we had last week, uh, for those of the, of those of you who hadn't seen this, we had watched American, uh, gigolo and I thought it was okay, but I found it kind of cold and I had trouble getting into it. I was worried that this movie would have the same effect on me. And from the get go, I was pleasantly surprised because I'll watch any movie, any genre, any type of story as long as if I can connect or if it has a certain pace that that captures my attention this movie certainly did that um from the get-go I liked the story and um I thought that um William Hurt and Kathleen Turner were great um I would say overall I liked it a lot I would say my my reservations are more it's not dated in a bad way, but there are certain technical things that kind of uh, show that it's from 1981, where there's some, some sound effects or just some like style of music, some minor pacing issues, but I, I enjoyed it overall. If I had to give a stars to this, trying to be critical, 
I was going to give it a solid three, but I did like it a little more than that. I would give it three and a half because, first of all, I thought the twist was really clever um, towards the end, who Kathleen uh, Turner turns out to be. And it also shows um, you look back at her performance in a whole different way. And so some moments where I thought she was actually kind of stiff, that actually is her character being manipulative. So it's like a nuanced and great. I, I, I like Ted Danson a lot. I thought he was very like kind of like offbeat. Um, and I have to say that one of my favorite scenes in the movie is probably Ted Danson and um, – William Hurt talking on a dock at night yes. towards the end of the movie when Ted That's Danson great is so clearly aware that William Hurt is guilty on some level. But yeah. Ted Ted Danson's personality is like just basically like sunshine and kind of goofy throughout the whole movie. And that's the one moment where he's like looking through William Hurt. And there's a great mm. line where Hurt, Hurt was like, do I need a lawyer? And he's like, you're talking to him now. And I was like, oh, yeah. man. Yeah. Um, that's what, so that's one of the no best scenes in the movie. Yeah, yeah there was disappointment. Yeah. I, I, so I, love I would the, say- I love, but not just to piggyback on that. I love the fact that you've got this lawyer and you've got a district attorney that are best friends in this. And that, first of all, that's a rare thing. I feel like I don't know if that happens much in real life, but the dynamic between them and the the other uh, friend in this, the, the Oscar Grace's character. Um, yeah, J.A. Preston. The three of them, they're all their scenes together. That dynamic was just gold to me, the way they all play off each other. But I continue, Sam. No, they seemed like real friends. And when they got more and more suspicious and like William Hurt was like backed into a corner, I was, you know, I actually I felt involved in this in a way that I didn't feel involved with with Richard Gere's situation. The other film, they're different mm-hmm. movies, but um. But I, I like seeing stars that are known for other things, at least other things that I know them for doing something different. So I'm a big fan of the Rambo movies and Richard Crenna is like a general and he's like Rambo's mentor and he's like Rambo is the best. And he's like this. That's In this movie, he was so different. Um, I loved his performance. I thought he was I thought he was great. I, Sam, so all I could think of is Colonel Troutman when I'm seeing Richard Crenn on screen. <laughs> yeah, he's like, you have to do what you have to do what it takes. Rambo is the best, and if anyone tries to upset my wife, I will kill them without hesitation. <laughs> um, but so I, I would say overall, I, 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 I did enjoy it. I would say the one thing, and it didn't really bother me that much, was I can, I mean, I understood that like you know Kathleen Turner was seductive and like drove William Hurt like cr- in crazy o- head over heels. I thought his leap to let's kill her husband to me seemed a bit quick because it's like, here's this guy that's ready to murder for her. And I know they had to do that for the story. To me, that just seemed kind of like a jump. But I would say overall, I enjoyed this film. I, and and, and uh, the, the only reason I wouldn't give it a higher rating is because I thought it was very good. I enjoyed it. I think I don't think it being an 81 hurts it in any way. I don't think it like... I don't think it rises above or subverts the genre or is like, this is a a game changing film noir movie. I just think it's a solid, good Mm -hmm. film noir movie that I did enjoy from start to finish. And when I saw the opening title and the opening scene, I thought I was not going to enjoy it. I was like, no, 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 not, not this again. And then it like, it (laughs) engaged me. So three, three and a half, three and a half solid stars for me. I I would, Mm -hmm. I would recommend. Yeah. Thank That's you, me. Sam. All right, we're going to move to to Ellie. Tell us about your thoughts on Body Heat. Well, let me see. Where should I start? Ah, uh, I don't feel like this movie did anything for me. Again, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> William is that William Hurt? Yes, mm-hmm. William Hurt, Hurt. Yeah, Hurt. My whole. Two hours. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he's kind of cute. He's kind of cute in huh. his own way. Um, he's got a body that is okay. I don't know the technical part. They really made me believe they were in the heat. I kind of went to get a lot of water. I don't find the scenes steamy enough. Um, you're not going to get horny out of it. It's just stupid. So, oh, I said the word stupid. I'm sorry. Um, if, they try, if, they were, if they were trying to make me feel like a little bit of something, like sexually, it didn't. Okay, it failed. As to the love story, because, you know, 
um, what's her name? Rencine? Rencine? Is it her name? Rencine? N- Ned Racine? Maddie. And Maddie Walker. Maddie. Yeah. Right. So if she loved him and he loved her, I did not feel the notebook essence in there. Well, There's I no- don't think it was trying to go did for that, you- though. And did you, know, you like the femme fatale aspect? Like, did you like her as like a manipulative woman? Like the court. I the think court she part, did. I part. do like uh, her performance because she made me angry. And if there she can go. make me feel angry because she's like, I never want my son to meet a woman like that because I will come out with an axe <laughs> and I will, I will like cut her in little mm-hmm. pieces. But well, it's effective. But it was. Effective. She was very effective. As okay. to her it's performances, eh, I don't really care. <laughs> He's cute. Um, so overall, for me, this movie didn't do anything. I don't think yeah. I, I enjoy Noir, whatever you call those movies, as much as you guys do. Uh, I'm a serial killer type of person. Ooh. And uh, comedy, but, <gasps> but 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 I ha- haven't said that. I think there was. Um, I did like the cafeteria and drinking coffee. Um, I like Stella. I thought she was cute. Um, what else? Ted Danza was funny. I like him. He was really he was kind of fun and quirky in this. Yeah, one. I liked yeah. him. I like his performance. Um, and I have to tell you, the very very first scene when the first time they hook up. Uh, when he throws that chair into the window. Oh my God, that's so funny. Okay. I love it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> have you ever seen a soap opera in Spanish? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Like, yes. 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 Kiss me. <laughs> yes. That's, I think. <laughs> or like a telenovela in Brazil. Or melodrama. Yeah. Yes. And so I just started laughing because the way she's just looking at him, like, laugh. waiting, like yeah. waiting, waiting for that chair. Wait, I'm like, what are you doing? You're just going to sit there and wait. Why didn't you just open the door? Like she couldn't just open the oh, door. It's, it's never really addressed. Like you know, he, the, the cleanup for that afterwards. And, you know, yes. gotta, it's not it's, sexy. You know, it's not, I feel like she's, that. She's got to explain to Edmund afterwards. Yeah, there was a, a big wind gust that blew down the door. I mean, how do you explain okay. that afterwards? I have to say <laughs> Mickey. Is it Mickey? Mickey? M- yeah. Mickey Rourke? All right, Mickey he's Rourke. hot. I, oh, oh, this bad boy. Mickey bad Rourke boy is hot. so cool in this movie. Yeah. Okay. And he, yeah. It actually made me sad, actually, because it made me just realize how I far am. he's fallen when I see I know, the young Mickey Rourke. It's, I, I, I totally, I totally agree. And he's so baby faced in his he's voice. Just, so he's, he's soft so, as a pillow. He's just I adorable. Just, I just, I just couldn't get enough of him. And I wish he'd been in the movie a lot more, but I don't think he was well known there then yet. Right? No, I, I think he from- looks great. And you know, what's funny is of all these, you know, we got some just terrible people in this movie but Mickey is the one real convicted felon in this, but he's the one guy that is legitimately concerned <laughs> about Ned's well-being in this. And he would yeah. went as far as to offer he's to- He's so likable. Yeah, he is. He he went as far as to like offer to like uh, to do the job, the arsonist job for, for Ned. I and know. He's the nicest like, guy in this movie. You're going to get in trouble. You're going to get in trouble. And I he just wanted to, to, I just wanted to slap him really bad. Not Mickey. Um, Hurt. But, I want to slap him. I want to go back to to Mickey Work. He has the line of the movie, though. Yeah. I'm gonna paraphrase it. So he says something like, "You've got like 50 ways you're going to screw this up, and if you think of 25 of them, then you're a genius, and you ain't no genius." <laughs> remember, you remember who told me that? And he delivers yeah. this so earnestly, yeah. and he honestly just want to doesn't want to see his friend get burned. But what I love is that obviously this is a reference to something that Ned told him. When he was bailing him out beforehand, yeah. mm-hmm. it's never said, but the audience can infer that. And I just love that about this film that we, the audience, can make that that leap. So I think so uh, I thought yeah. his character was straight out of The Outsiders. Like every time mm-hmm. I saw right? him, I wanted to be like, right? "Stay gold, pony." Boy. Oh my god, I <laughs> loved him. I I was like, "Oh hello, who is this, Mickey? What? Oh my god!" But um, yeah. So there were some parts of the movie that I, you know, I just. 
I didn't connect to the movie at all. Not the love story, not the sex. Um, there was, I don't know. It's just like a soap opera to me, you know? That's how I saw it. But um, I did like um, I, Catherine Turner's performance in this film. I liked that mm-hmm. she made me angry that I wanted to slap her really bad because I wanted to like, don't do that. I, 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 hurt i wanted to go in there and be like don't be stupid she's playing you man she's playing you yep. and um did you want to hurt hurt Sorry. i wanted to hurt hurt <laughs> so i give it to two stars two stars all right i will say that when hurt Honestly, killed richard Karena, um i i didn't I, it's a technical thing he just like hits him once over the head with like a broken chair or something and my first thought Good. was man it was would take more than that. Like I don't, I'm not like sadistic, but I was like, no, you should have like bludgeoned him more. And he just goes, Pert, it's and a it sloppy, should, it's a sloppy it just, assault, and I and I, I kind of yeah. like that because I love I love and when things go sideways. It reminded me of like a Coen Brothers type of uh, attack it's where like, like nothing simple. really went. Right. Yeah, that was it, it's the little things. Like that's what I mean about the technical thing. Like the sound effect of the wood hitting was like an was like 81 oh. audio, whereas like mm. today you would have heard like. And it was just those little technical yeah. things where I was like, "Ooh," uh, uh, well, but it was but still if, good. Yeah. If you hit the head in the right space, you can hurt somebody badly into death. So that's true. I want the listeners to know that before the show started recording, Ellie told us that we were all too dark. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I got I got tired of being a serial killer because my basement is so full now. I was like, "All right, all right, I've <laughs> got it out of my system," you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> All right, B. I, I, let's. I'd love to hear your thoughts on Body Heat. I really like it. I mean, this is a genre that's super in my lane. Um, I've seen this before. I enjoyed it then. I enjoyed it now. Uh, I think I'm a little more critical of it on second watch, but um, not to the point where I didn't, where I wouldn't watch it a third time. Um, I think everyone in this movie has great chemistry everyone ted danson uh officer grace obviously the two leads like everyone when they're on screen together does such a great job even when we meet um marianne simpson which by the way you have to love that the same guy who directed this movie and wrote luke i am your father also wrote hey lady wanna uh that's pretty (laughs) great (laughs) um yeah it's uh i think it's a movie that's really sexy and really about inference and assumptions um it doesn't show a lot it doesn't show a lot of violence and it also doesn't show a lot of gratuitous sex it's all about what you as a viewer take away from it i totally Mm. agree that when you when you watch it again from both sides you can really see how both sides are playing and i think kathleen turner knocks it out of the park she is a delight i would watch her all the time there's a couple of things like what you were talking about sam that feel with the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. With Lucky Land slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. (gasps) No, Lucky Land Casino. With cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Sort of played up, and I think it's in the style of the genre. I just don't know if in the 40 years from noir, classic noir, to this neo-noir genre, it's trans- translated as well. That sort of more stilted style of acting that exactly. William Hurt gets yeah. into. Yeah, they, like I, so I watched Double Indemnity earlier today because this is Double Indemnity, Billy Wilder's movie. It was based, Body Heat was based on this. Um, and like Barbara Stanwyck's eyebrows do not move in that movie. She no. is like, <laughs> she's very, very stilted. And that sort of 
style of acting was really common in classic noir. And I think William Hurt taps into that a little bit more. And I don't always think it's successful. Uh, Some of that is the chair moment. It comes across less passionate than I think they maybe wanted it to. But I also think it happens in at the end of the movie, because when they're all on their own, you lose that chemistry. So you lose the thing that's making the movie work so well. So him in jail with the eyes like just busting open and Mm -hmm. um, him just thinking of things on his own. Even the scene with Kathleen Turner, the final scene, I just think once the people who are working together so well in the movie are apart, I think the film sort of falls apart a little bit from me I there. agree. I think with with her and Turner apart for most of the second half of the movie, it loses a it lot lumbers. of its momentum. It does a little it bit. Just, yeah. It just lumbers to the end because it's so well paced. It's just plot, plot, American plot, plot. Gigolo. Yeah. I did yeah. think it was a little cheesy when he like pulls out and he's like driving in the fog and he pulls out and he like pulls out in front of a truck and then he like yeah. almost hits another car. Like that was good, but it had that deliberate pacing of like at that time for that audience, they might've been like, oh. and for me, it was like, yeah. you know, like that's it, what it felt exactly, like. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And I think, I think it actually did a great job at pacing the relationship between Matt and Ned. I thought that was especially compared to double indemnity because going again, going back to, to Billy Wilder's movie this afternoon, um, they decided to kill him like when they first meet. They were like, "This guy's gotta go." Yeah. yeah, they they obviously don't do that. They build them up together, but um, I think the ending loses its spark. I think it limps towards the end. Um, the first half is more than enough to make up for it, and I, I just don't think it needed that one final twist. I think it was fine without it. We we cut it a little bit shorter. We keep them maybe together. I don't know. Yeah, and I, th- I mean, I thought William Hurt was good. I just because he was a lawyer, I was surprised how how quickly he wanted to do murder. I was how like, how dumb hey, he is! Hey, no, all he, the yeah. problems. He's not a you, smart. He's not a smart lawyer. It's called out many and times. He, <laughs> guess not. Like, yeah. Must, not. must be all the cigarette smoking that's making him cloudy. Yeah, oh and so like much, Kathleen so Turner stands cigar- up in so that cigarettes. white dress. <laughs> Kathleen Turner stands up in that white dress and you're like, yes, I will go to hell for you. I will be in a swamp in Florida for you. Like a hundred percent. I'll follow you another. You want a guy dead rock and roll. Um, so I, I think it's, it's pretty plausible. I do think they could have done a little more to show him as a doofus, but I think if he went too dumb, none of it would have seemed like his ideas. She was really making it feel like it was his ideas. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I think there's a line that had to be tried. Interestingly, Kasdan and Hurt were talking about, you know, at the time this movie came out, there was a lot of blockbusters and Kasdan comes from that world and he sounded kind of resentful of them. He was like, I wanted a think piece. I wanted an intellectual movie. And it's kind of funny that this would be considered intellectual just based on how many shirtless scenes there are. Right. But it is. I mean, for a lawyer, a he story. didn't do any lawyering in this movie. I just enjoyed that I could actually like follow the story in this because sometimes film noir prides itself on making everything like who's this? What? Why is he talking? And and this movie I could like navigate, and so I enjoyed that. I don't need to be spoon fed, but I yeah yeah. There's no what? No, I love that. There's There's no no B plot. It's just exactly yeah. That helped me. It's just the story. I totally agree. Anyway, I really liked it. Um, I I'm going back and forth between three and a half and a four on this i'm just i'm a little torn um 3.75 i guess is how i cheat, <laughs> cheat us. time to eat all right yes yeah. yeah well i guess it's my turn this this film is pulpy with a capital p i i um, think it has two stellar leading performances from her and and turner uh, who are clearly a thousand percent committed to this and a supporting cast mm-hmm. that I think for a change, the filmmakers spend significant time with and develop an attachment that we're allowed to develop an attachment to. Uh, not only does it pay homage to classic film noir, especially Double Indemnity, which be mentioned is my favorite Billy Wilder film, mm-hmm. by the way, and it has its own distinct personality reflecting on, you know, postmodern elements. Uh, by the way, I, ha- I have a, a top 25 list from um, uh, on Letterboxd of my favorite um, 
I think it's he did about 25, 27 films. It's on Letterbox, oh. and uh, I put I put that. I think I mentioned it a couple months ago, and you can you can yeah you did your gotta get on. Uh, I still yeah, get, I'm gonna yeah. get on Letterbox, but when I get yeah. on Letterbox, you can friend yeah. Letterbox people, right? Like, yeah. can I? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, I want to be your friend, I'm on, Sam. I'm on Letterbox, but I never go really? on it. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I, I'm going to check it out because I'm going to look at your list like Nathan and your guys list and I'll see movies that I haven't seen and then I'll remember it like it's it's going to be I'm excited anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I I'll plug also, for I'll plug for our listeners. We have a list for our recommendation shelf on Letterboxd. Woo. I think I also one time had a, a top 25 list um from the 80s I created a while ago. And I don't think Body Heat was on it, but I think after this rewatch it's definitely cracking my top 25. Um, I loved this movie. And now seeing this probably for the first time in quite, it's probably been like eight, nine years. It, it, it's it's skyrocketing to the top. I really, really enjoyed watching it this time. You know, as I, I'm watching this movie again, I couldn't help compare this movie to what we watched last week, American Gigolo. And as much as I really did enjoy Paul Schrader's neo-noir acid lit vision of LA at the dawn of the eighties. The first half of that film was very much an exercise in minimalism to tell its story in many ways. Obviously Richard mm-hmm. Gere was rocking some amazing suits and driving a great car and the, lo- fly. and the locations were gorgeous, but the storytelling uh, was stripped down. It was a study of identity and isolationism Body Heat in comparison in the neo-noir genre is like comparing a Terrence Malick film to Die Hard. I felt <laughs> right. the opening scene uh, to the closing scene, uh, the credits of this, this film just cooked. I especially mm-hmm. loved the scenes in the beginning where William Hurt and Kathleen Turner are on that pier and later in the bar. I think if you're unfamiliar with film noirs from the 40s, this dialogue could come off cheesy, but it's a 100% throwback to that it's era. It's straight out of the genre. The sexual tension in these scenes is through the roof. Yeah, it's melodramatic and over the top, but undeniably entertaining. Watching these two, who I think have just terrific chemistry on screen. I love the setting for this film, the Southern Florida small town going through uh, this heat wave, which plays such a huge factor in this movie. They do a great job selling this aspect of the film as part of the production design. Everything is wet and sticky. Even though I know this was during a cold Florida, I, I, they did such an awesome job just selling that, that vibe. I can feel the heat raiding off the screen. And as we all know, when it gets unbearably hot out, it gets uncomfortable. And I think it, I can picture it playing a role in Ned's decisions. You know, the guy mm-hmm. can't think straight. He, he's allured by this temptress, and I feel he's aided by the inability to think straight from the heat. I, I feel like that played he's a, a in part hell. of this. He is. Yeah. So um, I, I I love this movie. I I was in the bag for this movie, 100%. Um, I give this a four and a half out of five stars. This is Whoa. easily, possibly in my top 10 of the 80s. Wow. I will it say to throw um, to throw America, I mean American Gigolo a line. I like this a lot better than American Gigolo. I will say that I thought American Gigolo's cinematography um, had a step up on this film, but I enjoyed this movie a lot more. If that makes sense, just uh, mm. American Gigolo's some of the visual shots they were cold, but there was a real look. This movie was great, and I thought it, the cinematography was good. I just technically like some of the American gigolo cinematography better, but I enjoy this movie mm. much more as a whole. If I, I mean, I, mm-hmm. I would rather watch this movie again and I probably will now that I know the twist and the second viewing will add more. So I mean, I, I like it much more than gigolo. For sure. I would not be watching you know, this movie again. <laughs> it's, it's interesting that, um, that you brought up some of the social mores because I think both of these movies are, are Reagan year movies or, or just, they're around. So yeah. I think you, ha- you have like this boom of neo-noir in this era. And I actually, I know it's a double indemnity remake basically. Um, but I think it's a lot like detour too. If you're, if you're a classic noir fan, just mm-hmm. that sort of um, defeatist, just very like defeatist and isolated and that, that melancholic attitude. 
Okay, yeah. And this movie had that, but it it, it also had flair. There was more like energy to well, it. Well, had like, people. I, it had people. I found like American Gigolo like downright like enervated at times. It was just like mm. this was like you know bouncier and and oh, just like, there was more to chew on so, there. So I want to talk a little bit about the 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 final act of this movie because you know Sam, I think you said that you could follow the 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 how the plots unfolded uh yeah i actually did struggle a little bit i found myself pausing a couple times and rewinding a couple scenes because i don't think it's clearly spelled out and i actually don't didn't mind that because i like it sometimes where the audience does have to use their brain sometimes to figure Mm -hmm. things out and i think i had to and Mm -hmm. one of the things i found curious in this is that is that um, I think the movie actually could have possibly done it differently or done a better job um, helping the audience make the connection. H- how did Ned figure this out? Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Because I think it is kind of a leap. All of a sudden, like, he's in jail, and he figured out, oh, she's still alive, and he somehow makes the connection to look, look up a, a yearbook. Where, was this a seed planted somewhere early in the movie that he knew where Maddie went to high school? I, I missed that. The only th- and I wasn't quite sure that may have been a little bit of a leap. The one plant that I really did pick up on was towards the end of the movie. When one of his friends was talking to him, they were trying to find the person who, who the maid took the glasses but then the friend or the other lawyer, and I, I wish God, I wish I could remember it more specifically. But he said something like, he, he said something specific that immediately made me suspect Kathleen Turner that she was in on trying to get him on to get him in trouble. And that, I wish I could remember the line specifically. That was clear to me, crystal clear, where I literally followed that dialogue and went wait a minute, she's not being truthful about this. And she, and that's when I suspected her manipulation. And so based off that, even though him finding the, the yearbook was a leap to me, I was able to deal with it based off the previous setup that came early on in the third act, because I went, Oh, wait a minute. When they were hunting people down, it was clear that he didn't have all the facts and his lawyer friends were getting mm-hmm. information that made her a lot more suspicious. Um, there was a specific scene. I can remember it. I just can't remember how the wording went, but that was like a click for me. Yeah. I actually yeah. had a question too about that w- was a little unclear for me and maybe somebody else picked up on it. Cause I was getting a little distracted by the end. Um, in the gazebo, when Ned mistakes the Marianne character for Maddie, um, she's introduced as Marianne. And yes. Maddie is Maddie in that scene. And you sort of get that thing Roger Ebert is talking about, Roger Ebert is talking about, where um, she says, oh, that's my friend Marianne. She's like a sister or she would do anything for me or she loves me, something like that. Yeah. And then at the end, you find out, oh, well, maybe, you know, she assumed that's that was actually Maddie and she assumed Maddie's identity. Her real name is Marianne. So they like switch names and maybe the real Maddie is blackmailing her. And I was just like, wait, what? So, so this so is something, sudden. this is what we should discuss here because I think there, this needs to, because I think it can be confusing. So my interpretation of what happened here is this, this was a long con for the Kathleen Turner yes. character. Ob- obviously she made a deal with her high school friend, Marianne, Marry that rich guys I, the we're gonna, I want to marry this guy, but I have this dark past. I want to switch identities with you. I am going to pay you off to switch exactly. identities. That's how I interpreted this. And in the gazebo, if you notice, it's really quick. And I actually went back and watched the scene again. She hands Marianne an envelope. 
Mm. It's net. You draw. It's no attention drawn to it at all. It's a very quick moment. They actually make a little peck. They kiss each other. Hands are envelope. Bye. Have a good time. You two. It's a quick little yeah. moment. Hands are envelope. Oh, yes, she is. walks off. That is a payoff. Yeah. I and thought it, it was something like she was just also burning this friend that she owed money to in the yeah. process. I Didn't she, she kill her? I thought she killed her. Yes. Didn't Matthew yes. Turner so, kill her? So, like, I so, thought to like stop the payoff. Right? So here's the thing, but this, yeah. this yeah. is the interpretation. So this, their deal is probably on the up and up or where she was going to do this. But, she, but Kathleen Turner decided that I don't want to keep paying off this person, but I can get rid of both William Hurt and my friend at the same time stopped paying her to to keep keep my this fake identity by killing Marianne and mm. William Hurt in the boathouse. Mm. So I don't think that she was being blackmailed. That's the way I interpreted it. This was just a way of her just uh, cutting off any loose end as well and stop having to pay somebody that she didn't have to. That's what I thought too. Yeah. I thought the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, blackmail just came from the Wikipedia because I was confused about it. But, but maybe. <laughs> you have to go look we, it up. But it's, it, it's, it's never fully explained, but it could. That's not I like maybe. that we're not. Yeah. I like that we're not spoon fed the information. I don't want to know too much more, but then the end happens and it feels like a lot happened for a little bit. I, I would have liked a little more fleshing out on that. And I knew there had to be something because when she goes and she's like, okay, I'll go check myself and the boathouse, like the gazebo blows up, I'm like, there's no way that she set that and committed suicide like that. I was like, no, 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 no. No. And, yeah, and, like, did, yeah. and did she have every single possibility planned out? Like, did she, I mean, she rigged the boathouse to blow up thinking that Ned was going to go in there and blow up. But when he didn't, first of all, how did she blow up the boathouse? Did she have a second option to blow it up without blowing up herself? I mean, there's- She could have just thrown something at the door. You know what I mean? I like guess. unless the door just moves. It's <laughs> it's rigged with the explosive, you know? I like, get, I, I get. She just seemed really calm when her that, plan didn't go- Criminal plan. mastermind, a criminal yeah. mastermind. I mean, seriously, I mean- <laughs> That's the one thing where her mastermind level is so mastermindy. You're like, okay, yes, you could be that much of a mastermind, but it's more of like you'll a You'll be a surprised. Yeah. You'll be surprised what women can do when they set their minds to do it. That's I true. Mean, I, just, I just mean that the, the level of mastermindedness is like oh, it's, we're good. it's more, we're good. Right, I mean, yeah. and the other thing is that she was she set Ned up way long ago when she learned about this. What was the other? What was the case that he screwed up early on, which is like a throwaway scene in the very beginning that you don't even supposed to make pay about much mind will. to. Yes, yeah. about the will. But at the very beginning of the scene, of the movie, there's a scene where he's ridic he's ridiculed by some judge or something like that. I think that's mm -hmm. somehow ties into it, and it comes back to bite him. But like, I completely forgot all about that. Yeah, it just requires like perfect, perfect patience, and like, there's so many things that can go wrong, and and to do all that, yeah. it's like super I, level, you know? Like, yeah. And she knew that this guy was going to find her. Yeah, it's like I wonder it's like if some of this was cut. I wonder if there was some of this filmed and it was cut. Maybe. I don't know. Awesome. It's, I, I haven't yeah. found any. I, I, I tried to find as much as I could interviews and from Lawrence Kasdan or William Hurt about this. I haven't found anything about missing deleted scenes or more that was uh, not shot or was written for this. I haven't found anything. Mm. I don't know. I'd be curious. Seems yeah. like a messy story to me. It ain't. It ain't I perfect. It for <laughs> by far, it it is not. No, but it's. No. it's I liked it. I liked it a lot. I am kind of sad that it lost like every award it was nominated for. Gee, I wonder why. And it lost to some real stinkers. But it <laughs> was, like it seemed like it was in some competition with other other awards. I was like, really? I don't remember those movies at all. And this is kind of a seminal. What movies? Award. Maybe I know those movies. Um, it lost the Golden Globe uh, for New Star of the Year to Pia Zadora for Butterfly, which I haven't seen, but I've also never heard either. of. Yeah. Don't know. I've heard of Body Heat. Um, it lost to uh, Warren Beatty's movie Reds. Reds, twice. but Reds is really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Is it? I haven't seen it. I, I like Reds. Best, yeah. um, Best Picture went to Chariots of Fire that year. 
Yeah. Okay. Best director went to no, yeah. Best director went to Warren Beatty for Reds. Um, didn't get nominated for m- much. William Hurt did not get nominated. Yeah. Uh, Kathleen Turner did not get nominated. Reds is not perfect, the, but it's kind of epic. That's you know, yeah. It lost the, the Academy, the, though. They never get it the right. Gandhi. It lost Gandhi? the BAFTA to Gandhi. Yeah, which Gandhi might it was the it was came out in eighty two. Yeah, so was Gandhi later. beat e, uh, e. T. for um, Best Picture, but I don't know if E. T. was nominated. I thought it was, but yeah, but I like Gandhi. Gandhi's I good. Think, I don't think Bobby yeah. he got any nominations. I'm not seeing any nominations for Body Heat. I could be wrong, but I just kind of went through. Not the... for for which one? What are you looking for? I'm looking at um, Body Heat for any. Uh, I was I was looking at Academy Awards. I didn't see any. I didn't. Look oh no! So Awards. it's nominated for a BAFTA. It was nominated for Edgar Allan Poe, Golden ah. Globes, Writers Guild of America, and okay. the Los Angeles Film. Did Awards. it get any technical awards like cinematography? Any nominations like that? Yeah, yeah. the cinematography yeah. was good. It's just like American Gigolo was like cinematography city. You know, like. I yeah. think they ran it mostly for like newcomer roles, like those kinds of awards. Yeah. Hmm. Well, at least like at least it got newcomer. It didn't win. It didn't win. They just ran it. Didn't win any award. It was nominated for six awards and didn't win any of them. All right. Well, I'd like to um, move on to what enough. each of us have for our MVP for body heat and this could be an actor somebody on the cast and crew or a scene or a prop or anything let's share what we have for that sam would you like to go first please i i gotta say just because he he stood out to me i would i would have to go with ted danson even though he's not like the most prominent role like in the film the reason that i liked him so much is because i've just i just know him so much from other types of roles and from cheers and all that stuff. Oh, everybody knows his name. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But uh, um, (laughs) that was good. Um, uh, But, (laughs) but, but I like, here's the thing. He's not like clearly not the most important part of this movie. He's a supporting character. I just was impressed with his performance because of its nuance. And because of that scene on the docks, at night, I just thought he was an interesting character. Is he the most I- important character in the movie? No, definitely not. But I'm just picking him because he of. I just thought his performance was definitely of note. Lucky Land Casino asking people, "What's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky?" Lucky in line at the deli, I guess. Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. With Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. And well done. Um, yeah, and I, I just thought great. he was, he was like, he seemed like a real, they all did, but he seemed like a real person to me. So that's, that's why I picked him for that. Awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ellie, what is your MVP? Was, was it the closing credits? <laughs> <laughs> um, I struggle with that, but I must say it was Catherine. Is it Catherine or Kathleen? Kathleen. Kathleen. Okay. So Romancing was, the Stone was coming up, sir. It was Turner's moment when she <laughs> when they he they say goodnight, she walks in, he's supposed to leave, but then he comes back, looks at the window, and she's standing there staring at him, and he breaks the window. Not the breaking of the window, but that moment when he walks up to her and she's just like this. <laughs> For our listeners out there, I'm so sorry you can't see this, but 
<laughs> and I'm thinking like, what are you doing? And then I all I thought was like, oh, the drama, the drama, the drama just for one kiss. So wasn't romantic, <laughs> but that I give it to her because, she, you know, she just She's yeah, going she for sold it. it. She sold it. Yeah. Yep. B, what do you got for your MVP? MVP. Kathleen Turner. Just Kathleen Turner all day. I thought she crushed this role. She was made for it. Um, And you see hints of her tapping back into it in the future. Like in War of the Roses, you can kind of see. It's awesome. It's it's such a good movie. Um, I wish that was on. It's not quite film noir, but I wish we could. I love that movie. I love War of the Roses. We can watch it anyway. We can (laughs) just watch it. Um, Yeah, I thought Kathleen Turner, but I also I wanted to give like a a shout out of recognition uh, to Kathleen Turner's pencil skirts as well, because they did a lot of work in this movie. (laughs) She wore a lot of white. That's for sure. Yeah, because it's nods sexy. also to uh, to Barbara Stanwyck also because she has a dress yeah, that white in dress. Double Indemnity, which uh, I think it was definitely a direct homage to. Yep. Um, all right, everyone's stealing my thunder, but you know, um, <laughs> I'd say you know here's the thing though I, I I could easily say the scene where William Hurt tosses that deck chair through the window, but it's so damn obvious. I feel like I've seen that clip a dozen times during Academy Awards, you know, during those movie montages, that's mm-hmm. like a go-to thing for them. And, you know, there are many juicy scenes to pick from, but I, I want to go with what is my favorite supporting actor performance in this film. And that is one Mickey Rourke. And the reason oh. is because seeing him so young and so healthy looking and speaking yeah. with that smooth ass silk voice actually made me sad knowing how far he fell late in his career. The amateur boxing didn't help either. And every scene he is in gives this movie energy and I loved it. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how many times Mickey Rourke is going to come up in this podcast. So there, Mickey Rourke is my MVP. That's so solid. Yeah. All right. Without him, they couldn't have had all the, those arsons. So that's, that's right. All yeah, that yeah. was really all good. Yeah. Earning. He was so. excellent. Okay, so it is now time for the most important part of our podcast. <laughs> Something in this field could be releasing the chemical into the air when there's too many of us together. Don't eyeball me, boy. I see your mother driving up and down the street looking at me. I'd be your stepfather by the week. It's a bad time, Bob. I'm serious. If I leave now, I'm not coming back. Give it here an expression. You got a phase only a mother can love. Let's just stay ahead of the wind. That is our bumper for wall casting, where we recast somebody from this film with Mark Wahlberg. Oh, yes, this is, I love this. this is, I look forward to this the most every week. I think about <laughs> this. my Monday, baby. I, I, I toil th- over this all week long. So here we go. Sam, who are we recasting in, in this film with? Oh, well, with Mark Wahlberg. This is tough for me because he honestly, I feel like he could fit into a bunch of roles in this movie pretty well. I feel like he could do the Mickey Rourke. He could do William Hurt. It'd be weird a little bit, but he, he I don't know. I, I'm, I'm going to pick, ah, I don't know if it's, I, man, I really haven't given this much thought. I, Kathleen Turner. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, not I, I, he couldn't Ted Dan, Just Ted Dan, say it. I don't know. I I well, I'm trying to think. Um, I guess Jane um, Larson come back to you. You know, <laughs> he, could, he could do the Richard Krenner role. I mean, it, it, he'd be like you know tough, and he'd be like kind of like uh, if you put the glasses on, he'd be like you take care of problems. You know, and I don't I don't like it when my you know I track my wife down. You, you know what I'm saying? It'd be weird, but he could do that, I suppose. I don't know. It's a tough one. I guess, yeah, that's what I picked. I mean, but. He, he did do that movie where he's like a stalker, right? That's true. Fear, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah that's right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Let me in the house. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Ellie. Oh, Kathleen Turner. Yeah. You would replace Kathleen yeah, Turner. It'd, it'd be a different movie, but. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sure. sure. All the sure. way. <laughs> I would do the Ted Danson role as Mark Wahlberg. He could do that. I think he's got an yeah. earnestness. I think he could pull yeah. it off. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'd be sad to lose Ted Danson, but. I know. I, th- I thought about that as well. Um, this was hard. 
I think it, it, it would be so easy to recast uh, J.A. Preston because he plays the detective, but we've been down that road so many yeah, times exactly. already lately. So has and, Mark Wahlberg. And, <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I just showered Mickey Ward with all this praise, how he's the MVP of this film. But there is no doubt in my mind that if I had to recast someone in this film with Mark Wahlberg, I'd put him in the role as Teddy. And I would uh, totally expand his screen time, though, in this movie, though. I think Mark would be great as the arsonist friend of Ned, who, um, of all the associates, probably is the, has his best interest at heart, I think. Because Mark has that kind of soft-spoken, you know, like, I'm just looking out for you, you know? <laughs> I, think, I think he could do it. looking out for you, you know? buddy. <laughs> Don't do this. Don't go down this road. It's wrong. <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah, um, but I, I want him to have a bigger. In, I want him to have a bigger role in the movie, though. Was this in Wahlberg's Calvin Klein era? Wasn't he a Wasn't he a Calvin Klein model? Because I feel yeah. like that colors this movie a little. It was, bit. but it's kind of it was sort of early for that. It, maybe not. I don't know, but it's too early I don't for remember. Calvin Klein. He is yeah, yeah, too early for Calvin Klein to like nineties. I think maybe this is nineties, oh, eighties. Yeah. 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 He was rapping mm-hmm. before that. That's right. Yeah. Funky bunch. All right. Excellent. All right. So I think we can. Or getting in trouble, going to jail. So one or the other. (laughs) (laughs) All right. I think we can close the book on body heat. This was a, this was a fun discussion. Thank you everyone. All right. We're going to transition to our next segment, but uh, first I just want to express gratitude for tuning into our show. Your feedback on a discussion of Body Heat means a lot to us. You can connect with us on Facebook and Instagram by searching for Back to the Frame Rate or email us at backtotheframerate at gmail.com. Your support is greatly appreciated. If you have a moment, please consider leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your preferred podcast platform. We highly recommend that you subscribe to our newsletter, Frame Rate Monthly. This, the newsletter is packed with details about our podcast, including what we're currently watching, upcoming discussion topics, and upcoming retrospective series, interactive polls, and other engaging content. To subscribe to our newsletter, simply send an email to us at backtotheframerate at gmail.com and include newsletter in the subject line. And speaking of interactive polls. We have a poll that we're doing this month and it goes through the end of November. And I think what we're going to do is uh, we'll release the poll results on the last episode of this month. But the question is, what is your favorite decade of film noir slash neo-noir films? And that's the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, or oh, sorry, 80s or 90s. And uh, just to give an example, like 1940s would be films like Double Indemnity or Maltese Falcon, The Third Man, uh, Notorious, perhaps uh, 1950s movies like Sunset Boulevard, Touch of Evil, Strangers on a Train, In a Lonely Place, 1960s. Um, A couple examples would be like In Cold Blood, Cape Fear, Point Blank, uh, 1970s like Chinatown, Night Moves, Taxi Driver perhaps, or The Long Goodbye, 1980s, which the genre that uh, the decade we're doing now, Blade Runner, perhaps, or Blue Velvet, Blood Simple, or the 1990s, like LA Confidential, One False Move, Seven, I think, would fall into that category, or even Fargo. So a couple examples, submit your, participate in our poll, and I'll put the uh, the link in the show notes. Wow. So let's get to our next segment, our recommendation shelf. Hello, welcome to Masterpiece Video. How may I help you this afternoon, sir? I'm looking for a copy of Eight and a Half. Is that a new release, sir? No, it's the classic Italian film. Yes, sir. Just check that on the computer for you, sir. Hello, how are you young ladies this afternoon? May I help you find a particular Masterpiece movie? No. (laughs) Yes, here it is. Nine and a Half Weeks with Mickey Rourke. That would be in the erotic drama section. No, not nine and a half, eight and a half. The Fellini film. How about this one? <laughs> Get it, I'm sure it sucks. All these movies suck. 
<laughs> that is our bumper. <laughs> for- that'll, be, that'll be me like at the end. That movie sucks. This all this movie sucks. <laughs> That is our one of our bumpers for our recommendation shelf, which um, was this he in nine and a half weeks. I'm sorry, was he in that movie nine and a half weeks? Mickey Rourke. Yeah. Yes, that was a uh, erotic drama. Yeah, I actually like that movie. We're, 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 yeah. Oh, cool. We will <laughs> have to have a erotic drama April. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Easter erotic dramas. Oh, yeah, there we go. That's, oh, perfect. Easter, perfect. really, baby? Easter? My mom's going to kill me. We should have a mock wall book match. Mock and match. 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 Mock and match. Mock and match. I love that. So, so, like so, someone never sets in Somerville, yo. Never sets. He, he does not like being oh called Marky Mark. That's true. Okay, well, he can't hear me. So. Well, yeah. this week we're um, – our recommendation shelf uh, – is going to be Femme Fatale films. Perfect tie into this week's this week's um, film review, and um, yeah, I can't wait to hear what everyone has for their selection. So, do we need to define what a Femme Fatale is to our audience, or do you think we that's obvious to the world? People got it. I think people got it. So, oh, Sam, you give me that look. Oh, I know. I, well, <laughs> yeah. I was like actually, Kat- just, honestly, I was just looking at myself going, wow, I'm attractive. Uh, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but hey, who better than to tell somebody that you're attractive than yourself? So That's true. Thank you, Ellie. Roger Moore here. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm just going to read this. You know, I'm sure our our listeners out there know what a femme fatale is, but a femme fatale, sometimes called a man eater or a vamp, is a stock character of a mysterious, beautiful, and seduct or seductive woman who charms or ensnares her lovers, often leading them into compromising, deadly traps. There you go. So, let's get into our picks this week, Sam. I'm going to go with uh, 2002's Best Picture winner, actually, uh, Chicago. Excellent movie. Um, it, it usually, in general, sometimes movie musicals are not my like main genre, my thing. But I love that film. I thought it was amazing. Um, I think mm-hmm. Catherine Zeta-Jones and Renee Zellweger are both brilliant fil- uh, femme fatales in that movie because it's all about – manipulating the media to get out of guilt and, and uh, uh, obsessed with fame. And Richard Gere is the cynical, but very powerful Chicago lawyer that that movie has the best, some of the best editing in cinema that I've ever seen. And one device that I love in that movie is sometimes in musicals in people just break into song in the middle of what they're doing. That movie makes the distinction between the real world and, and the fantastical mm-hmm. musical world where the, all the music scenes are kind of like imagined scenes. Um, and then it goes back to reality. And there's an incredible scene in a, a courtroom. I, I don't know the exact name of the song, but uh, uh, Richard Gere has a song like Give Him the Old, like Razzle Dazzle. It's Razzle and it, Dazzle. Razzle yeah. Dazzle. Thank you. And it intercuts perfectly between the real courtroom to great metaphoric shots of him like playing with the judge and like, women like in like devil outfits, like going around on swings and stuff like that. And it just, the, the filmmaking is brilliant. 100% a great film, a femme fatale movie because they literally fit that definition. Multiple characters doing that film. Um, and I'm blown away by that movie. I remember my father wanted to see it when we were on a road trip. I was like, Oh, all right. I guess, you know, I, I, I kind of wanted to see two towers again, Lord of the Rings, because it was in the theater at the same time. And and I saw Chicago and was just like blown away by it, blown away. So that would be my pick. All right. Thank you, Sam. I think that's uh, not streaming now on Prime Video and Paramount Plus. So that's where people can find it. Great. Ellie, what have you got for your pick? You know, I just picked Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Mm-hmm. Okay. Classic. Like and I movie. love yeah. the fact that they put these two actors together for this film because for one, they're so good looking and 
I just enjoy looking at them. But Angelina Jolie is my favorite actress, um, or at least one of my top five favorite actresses in this world. And I love what she does. I love her, um, you know, when you talk about, how do you say that word? Femme, femme fatale? Mm-hmm. Yep. Femme, femme fatale. I can't think of any more any other woman that's more seductive and, and mysterious and um, attractive. I love Angelina. That Angelina. I, she's just like, the, the beauty, she's breathtaking. And so for me, this movie, I love the action. I love how they start like husband and wife and they just, you know, um, they're obviously killers, as assassins. And, you know, they're going to get a job eventually where they're going to go and try to kill each other. And I just love that because in real life, some couples try to kill each other, <laughs> you know, but, you know, but, you know, you know, like just, um, I shouldn't have said that. That's kind of like mean, but it's true. <laughs> hey, it happens. But even in a movie, um, the fact that they both have the same job, imagine working with someone. I, I don't know what it would be like if my husband was a doctor and I was a doctor as well. <laughs> it's just going to be like, would be just like this. Yeah, we'll try to be like <laughs> right about every diagnosis. And he'll be like, no, this is how it is. And I'll be like, no, this is how it is. And so um, I loved it. Uh, I recommend it just because it's plain fun to watch and to watch those two together. And I think this is the film that started their real relationship. Uh, uh, and then that's where they hook up and, you know, became a thing. Uh, in they have beautiful children now, but now they're divorced. So I guess the real Mr. and Mrs. Smith didn't work out after all. <laughs> that's all I have to say. All right. Um, B, what have you got for your pick? Um, I went with Gone Girl uh, this week. Ooh, wow. It was such a joy to rewatch Gone Good Girl. Choice. I love David Fincher. Um, and I think Amy Dunn is a brilliant femme fatale. I really, when I first watched this movie, when it came out in 2014, I really did not see that twist coming. I hadn't read the book. Um, and it just, it blew me away. I thought it was so well done. And watching it in the context of Body Heat and then rewatching Double Indemnity, I was like, this is the same movie every 30 or 40 years. And what a treat that we get to see this on screen for different generations and it's done a little differently every time. And the, the femme fatale is revitalized and redesigned a little bit each time, but it's still that same thing of, of falsifying violence and manipulation and battle of the sexes. It was just an absolute treat and it makes a good, uh, not a double feature, a triple feature with double indemnity and uh, body heat. Gone Girl really does great. like reinvent the genre too. Like that's a movie that goes like Absolutely. above and beyond and like modernizes it and like really, like, yeah. It is yes. fantastic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, am I up? Mm-hmm. You're up. I am up. Rock and roll, Nathan. I'm not ready, but yes. Um, <laughs> so I am. All right. So I, I have to. I'm phoning it in this week, guys. Because of our review of Body Heat and the natural derivativeness to the Billy Wilder film noir classic, I feel and felt I had no choice but to recommend the one of the OGs of the genre, 1943's Double Indemnity, and the lead performance Ooh. from one Barbara Stanwyck. Now, I don't know She's perfect. For our listeners so. out there if I should assume that everyone has seen this 80-year-old film, but I'm guessing if you're a fan of Body Heat and Film Noir, Neon Noir, that this is probably old hat. However, if this is a blind spot um, for anybody out there on anyone's radar, you know, I think this is a must-watch for any cinephile. A month or so ago, I shared, like I said, my, my letterbox list of my ranked Billy Wilder films in Double, Double Indemnity is my number one of his. Barbara Stanwyck plays Phyllis uh, Diedrichsen, and in this bone-chilling performance, she is the quintessential femme fatale of this genre. She's cunning and manipulative, and the way she seduces Fred McMurray is a masterclass in playing morally complex and ambiguous characters. She plays... Uh, her character uh, on the surface, full of desperation and loneliness, but there's also a vulnerability to her. Um, very multi-dimensional performance. So 
She wears yeah. also, like I said before, this white dress that I can't help but think was a heavy influence on the wardrobe that Kathleen Turner wore. That's such of a Maddie, great the scenes in Body Heat. So um, I don't have much to say about this. I rewatched it uh, again uh, this week just because I wanted to have it on in the background, and it is—it's just so good. It is must see. Watch it over and over mm-hmm. again. So that is my pick, uh, Barbara Stanwyck as Phyllis Dietrichson. And double indemnity, my fem, I think all time favorite femme fatale. I think people should watch more Barbara Stanwyck in general. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so those are our recommendations for this week, and we're going to move on to our last segment, our movie musings, where each of us will just mention what we have been watching or want to watch or anything we want to share in the world of movies, news, or anything. And we will begin with Sam. Anything so you this, want to share with us? This is a little bit, uh, it's brief, but it's a little bit of a non sequitur because I have not watched any movies uh, this week. But I will say briefly that um, I'm looking forward to, to re-watching This is where projects come to life. Our showrooms are designed to inspire with the latest products from top brands, curated in an inviting, hands-on environment, and a team of industry experts to support your project. We'll be there to make sure everything goes as planned, from product selection to delivery coordination. At Ferguson Bath, Kitchen, and Lighting Gallery, your project is our priority. Schedule your showroom consultation and see more from brands like Monogram at build.com slash ferguson. This is where projects come to life. Our showrooms are designed to inspire with the latest products from top brands, curated in an inviting, hands-on environment, and a team of industry experts to support your project. We'll be there to make sure everything goes as planned, from product selection to delivery coordination. At Ferguson Bath, Kitchen, and Lighting Gallery, your project is our priority. Schedule your showroom consultation and see more from brands like Monogram at build.com slash ferguson probably the Lord of the Rings trilogy over the holidays because I've actually been rereading the Lord of the Rings, uh, the book and, and uh, there are three books, but I mean, I just have like a one large volume edition. And I will simply say that when I read it, when I was 16, that was the last time I read it. I enjoyed it, but a lot of the descriptions of landscapes and details and history kind of went right over my head. Now over 25 years later, as someone who has traveled a lot and done a lot of hiking and hiked mountains in Scotland and gone all over the place, reading it now, I love Tolkien's description of landscape because Mm. I'm realizing that he's basing it off his own experience, whether it was walking around in the Alps or England. So it has a whole new meaning for me and the richness of the mythology and the transporting feel of that book just blow me away. And it's been a long time, so I'm going to go through it, finish it, and then go back to the three films um, and and see how they compare. I will say briefly that of the three films, though, Two Towers is not the best film critically wise. One of the reasons I've always enjoyed it so much is because The Fellowship of the Ring has a lot of setup to do and a lot of building. Return of the King has a lot of payoff to do. So they're like these two very- 17 endings. Exactly. They're like these two really well-constructed mansions where for me, Two Towers, the movie, is like this fun, like wet and wild water slide that connects the other two movies because it doesn't have to resolve anything. So it's just- Fast, 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 action, action, build up, suspense, Gollum, Battle of Helm's Deep. And it was one of the best movie theater experiences I ever had in my life. 2002, 1115 a.m. in the morning, um, Mm -hmm. Leicester Square, London, saw it with my father, sold out show. And I was just like blown away. So Lord of the Rings. Will you be watching the theatrical cut or the extended cut? I will There's be watching no the extended cut um, yes. because yes. <laughs> I've already seen the theatrical cut and I have the extended cut and I want to see all the detailed scenes. Oh, Having just read so the good. book, I don't want to lose any of that stuff. So only way to watch cut. those is yeah. the extended cut. I I was doing um pub trivia uh, la- early last year. And one of the trivia questions was, what is the exact running time of all three Lord of the Rings movies. Oh my God. Down to the minute. And our team, you know what? For some reason, I can't remember what our answer was, but out of like 
23 teams. Yeah, close to 10 we hours. got the closest. I don't know. We figured it out yeah. and and got it. We couldn't use Google or anything like that, but we yeah. we we figured it out. <laughs> what would be would it be like wait four, four like That'd be close to but, 10 right, but we had to go back to the we had to go back to the the, the guy the the MC like are you talking about I'm going to say 13 cut? 13 well, hours we, we, was... because I think I think yeah. they're not all I think the first one is not over three hours. It's like 172 minutes and like, it's like only the, the third one is cut, crazy yeah. long. The third one yeah. is the third one. Theatrical is three hours, it's 20 long, minutes. Yeah. The special edition yeah. is four like hours, hours, 10 minutes. Yeah. Yes. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. But uh, we, I'm really proud that the six of us got that question right down <laughs> within long. like two, three minutes. We got it like, Right. So yeah. Okay. That's all. Yeah, looked over at us like, who are these nerds? <laughs> <laughs> Sam, they got it within two young. minutes. Everyone else thought like, what are those like two hour movies? And like, no, wait, 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 like no, no, oh, no. God. Those movies are that. <laughs> then just like the main character in Revenge of the Nerds, you were like, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Sam. Those are the movies that got me into movies. Um, those came out. I'm gonna just tell everyone what an infant I am. Um, those came out when I was in middle school and my wow. dad was still alive at the time. And a uh, core memory for me, he uh, said that he had a doctor's appointment that day. So I didn't go to school and he kept me out of school every time the films were released. And we snu- we played hooky mm. oh, that's the incredible. for each oh. one, for each one of those, those movies. So that was, um, yeah, that's my, that's my memory with my dad. What best. a great, yeah. great memory. Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you. So Ellie, what do you want to uh, share with us? So I watched three different three different type of movies that you saw downsizing, uh, mm. uh with Matt Damon, Jason Sudeikis, and obviously one of my Is that favorite. any good? Hold over is coming out soon. Or is it out already? <laughs> it's out. Oh, I can't wait to see it. It's on Netflix. No, I'm talking about Was Hold Over. That's the new Ellie? that's the new Alexander Payne movie. That's why Which I'm one? watching it. Cut, that comes out uh, November tenth, uh, theatrically. I think yeah. it's already out. Uh, limited. Which, which movie? Locally. Holdovers. The, the, the holdovers. other, the new, the new uh, Alexander yeah, yeah. King movie. Yeah, yeah. Um. So, and Hong Show is in that movie, and she stole mm. the show for this film, in my opinion. Um, just watch it. That's all I'm gonna say. Uh, a good marriage. I, haven't seen it. I think it's the only Alexander Payne movie I have not seen. Yeah, yeah. It's good. Yeah. It's different. Um, I saw a good marriage. Um, Stephen King wrote that movie. Um, I don't know script. this one. Uh, and uh, it's a really interesting, um, th- a good marriage. Basically, Peter, no, Anthony La, La Paglia is a serial killer in this movie. Of uh, course. Is it more uplifting than a marriage story? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> It's uh, more action, I guess. No, I don't know. A marriage story was. I love my, a marriage story, so I don't. I can't even go there. And um, so, a good marriage, and just basically <laughs> a double feature, maybe. Uh, the the best part of that movie is when um, the wife uh, kills the serial killer who happens to be <laughs> her husband, <laughs> and then the detective um, finds out that I mean, that's what she did, and and then the detective he. She tries to kill the detective, but then um, she doesn't succeed. But in the end, he, the detective forgives her and tells her, I don't know anything. You didn't do anything. But it's a great film. It's fun to watch um, if you like that kind of Stephen King kind of mm-hmm. movies. Right. Um, and then I watched A Family Man with one of my favorite, Gerard Butler. He's hot. William Defoe. He's such a great actor, by the way, William. He's amazing. Awesome. Oh yeah. my god. He did such a Did you see yeah. the lighthouse? Huh? Did you see the lighthouse? I thought it was amazing. Oh, yes, I did. Did I anyone see yeah. inside yet? No, I've been no. I almost did it the other day and I didn't, but I want to oh. see it. And I just I love his I just love him as an actor and it's he's very versatile of an actor. Yeah. He can go anywhere, but in this film, he makes me want to punch him so bad. 
He really does because he plays so that, many movies inspiring you to violence. Ellie. He, well, listen, he plays this corporate dude who's just cutthroat, and uh, a Family Man is a story about um, a father who's so invested in his job that totally um, misses a lot of his kids and family and marriage and and wife's um, days uh, because he wants to make money, 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 money so much that. And one of his kids, the youngest, the oldest son, ends up getting a cancer. And, um, mm-hmm. oh, I cry my eyes out with this movie. Uh, but it has a great a great ending. Gerard Butler, there's a scene where, oh, he made me feel it. Uh, when, he, when he made me feel it. I'm not going to say this scene, but um, he's going into the hospital. And uh, he just, oh, that's a great movie. Movie. But going back to Liam Defoe, uh, I really think you would like uh, Inside Ellie. That's on streaming on, Did on Prime. Did you watch yet? Because I haven't seen it. But yeah, I, yeah. Twice I, I, I almost I almost hit the play button I and I went right to a Ellie. different movie. It's him trapped with himself in this high end apartment. He's a he's like mm-hmm. a high end art thief, and he gets stuck in there for weeks on end. And it's it's, something it's intense. Uh, William, I think you like this. It's such a his art, the acting, it, it, I, I just, <clears throat> I just love it. Like I just, yeah. I can watch him. Yeah, I think, and try to learn acting from him just by watching watch, his films. Watch inside. It is just William Defoe just acting his ass off for two hours. Really? By, him, by himself. Yeah. Okay. It's great. Okay, yeah, I have right to do that hour. this weekend because okay. I, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Florida <laughs> Project too. Oh, Florida Project, so good. Florida Project is one of my favorite movies of all time. Oh, I haven't seen that. I've one. seen that movie three times. Oh, it's so really? it's yeah, heartbreaking it's too. It's project. heartbreaking. It's hard to watch. Really? It's, so it's really mas- It's really masochistic of you to have seen it three times. But I got it. <laughs> it's Defoe, right? It's so it's, only, gonna... it's only because like I t- I'm just hip- hypnotized by by him in that movie, and I, I don't know. The something, something, oh, that she's talking about the Florida Project. But inside, Florida. yeah, yeah. I know. When did that come out, Florida Project? I think 2017, maybe. Or I've lost all concept of time, so <laughs> I don't know. That's Sean Baker, though, same guy that did Tangerine. Yep. Yeah. I'm going to put him on my list. And he also did, uh, what was the one that came out two years ago, which I really liked, too? About the, the ex-porn star that comes back to his town in, like, Texas. Red Rocket? Red Rocket. That was fun. That was fun. I, I didn't see that, that one. one either. I haven't seen it. That I was on my list, and it just, like, I just didn't get around to it. But um, you recommend that one to Mosto, too. I, I, I think it's a fun movie. I think it's a good time. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's it's also a hard movie to watch, but it's it's uncomfortable. An uncomfortable <laughs> I think that's kind what William does. Really, so he makes you feel uncomfortable. Yeah, he makes yeah, you, he yeah. breaks you it, there. It makes you feel something. That's yeah. for sure. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, we covered Ellie. We covered Sam B. Yeah, man. I didn't have a great movie week. It does pick up at the end, but I started real week with strays. I was trying to catch up on some movies that had been released this year. Don't recommend. Uh, that, that was not good. <laughs> That's the, um, watch that's my the big talking dog movie. movie. Which one's fine. You don't need to see the other two. Stop. Um, <laughs> and then watch. I think it's Quiz Lady. This this started the uptick. Um, that was really fun. Aquafina and Sandra O. Oh, they have great chemistry together. It was a fun movie. Uh, it wasn't. It finally, I needed to to lift my spirits. So I went to go see uh, another great noir movie. I went to see The Killer by the one and only David Fincher. I was playing at the Coolidge Corner Theater for those of you in Massachusetts. And it was fantastic. David Fincher is just on an insane run. Um, I loved it. I thought it was a real commentary on his legacy and on the archetype of, of heroes that he creates. It was funny. It was so much funnier than he's really given himself uh Liberty to be, I think. Um, I wish it had a longer theatrical release, you know? It's going to be on Netflix, and by the time this this episode airs, it's going to be on Netflix, I think, on November 10th. Yeah. 
Yeah. I wish they'd given it more of a chance in the theater. I would love to do that. It is, yeah. it is odd. It's just deal with Netflix though. It's just like the Mank, which came out a couple of years ago. It's, right. it's, yeah. it's just one of the, it's his deal with Netflix right now. That makes mm. sense. It releases. Yeah. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I'll probably have to wait till it comes to, to Netflix. I will too. say though, I don't think it's going to lose a lot being on a smaller screen. I think there's some movies where you're like, I have to see this on the big screen. I think this will translate. I think you can see this at home. Yeah. Cool. As much of an issue I have with the whole production and distribution, but. All right. Um, I also caught up with a couple new releases uh, this week. Even though I didn't have a lot of time, I just squeezed a few things in. I saw When Evil Lurks. This is the new Argentinian horror film from director Damien Rugna. Uh, It is a curious new spin on the demonic possession genre. It's about these people who live in a small town uh, and one of the residents is infected in this film, they refer to the possessed as the rotten and the people that would cl- kill them as cleaners. It's one of the things I did enjoy about this movie is that it has its own lore, its own terminology for many of the situations mm-hmm. that we're used to in films like this. The, the movie centered around two brothers and follows them as they attempt to save the, the people around them. But of course, not much goes according to plan. This film is morbid to the extreme not so much graphically, but thematically, there are some horrific elements in this film that I would definitely say, you know, could trigger parents of young children. So be warned. Uh, this film is getting a ton of love all around. But for me, I thought it was pretty good, but not, you know, my top film of the year or anything like that. If anything, I definitely do think that director Damien Rugna is someone I do want to follow up on and see more of his previous films. And I look forward to more of his upcoming projects. So it is, it's interesting. So it's, uh, it's streaming on shutter right now. I think it's the only place you can, you can find it right now. Um, I also saw, uh, this past week, the burial from director Maggie Betts. This film stars Tommy Lee Jones, Jamie Foxx and Jernay Smollett. I think I'm saying her name right. This is based on a true story about the pairing up of a funeral home owner played by Tommy Lee Jones, an eccentric personal injury lawyer played by Fox, who is convinced to take on this contract law case. If you enjoy courtroom melodrama, this film delivers. It's based on an actual trial, but it is mentioned that the facts of the trial have been dramatized for the film. And I have a feeling that is uh, that this movie is has a very loose interpretation of what really happened. Nonetheless, <laughs> it does have a very entertaining performance from Jamie Foxx, who I would best summarize as a Johnny Cochran-esque performance. The film uh, very much calls out Cochran as one of uh, Foxx's char- his, his character's idols in the movie as well. Tommy Lee Jones is playing Tommy Lee Jones in the most Tommy Lee Jones-esque performance I've ever seen. Pretty Tommy much giving what he <laughs> normally gives to a role like this. I do want to give a shout out to um, one of the supporting actors in here. I, I'm going to completely botch his name, but it's Mamadou Ma, Ma, Athi, I think is how you say his name. I, I botched it completely. He has a supporting role as Hal Dawkins, who is one of the members of the legal team. He is really great in this. I don't think I've ever seen him in anything before. I think he might have, he was in one of the Jurassic World movies. I don't remember him in it, but. He was by far the MVP of this movie. He was fantastic. This film was fine, but I don't think it's necessarily something you have to immediately start watching. It's a good stay in on a cold winter day type of movie. So maybe catch up on it sometime this November, December when you got nothing else to do. So it's on prime video. Um, and those are the, the two main things I just want to mention. I, like I said before, I did catch up. I watched again Double Indemnity. I did also continue my Robert Altman um, retrospective. I, I rewatched McCabe and Miss Miller. I actually um, watched some of it last night and today. And man, that movie still is uh, amazing. It is a revisionist Western. 
Um, I'm still kind of digesting. I haven't seen it in ages. Um, I, I think at some point I I, I want to maybe for our newsletter write some form of, write an article on on my um my retrospective for Robert Altman. But uh, maybe I'll do something yeah. for that. But I'm having a really good time rewatching all these old Robert Altman films. So yeah, that is what I have been watching this past week. And uh, yeah, I don't think there's anything else. I'm trying to think. Uh, no, that's about it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and I'm way behind on um, Better Call Saul. I'm in middle season four. I'm way behind, but I'm getting there. I will catch Great up someday. Show. <laughs> Great show. Great All show. Right. Great All show. right. Um, uh, Nate, what are we watching next week? We are watching next week. We are continuing our 80s neo noir retrospective. We are moving on to 1984's oh, Brian De Palma. Yes, Brian De Palma's <laughs> body double. Not oh, so. Sometimes gets confused with body heat, but body double, which, guess what? I have never seen this. I don't recall ever seeing this. <laughs> So I am I'm kind of I'm really psyched for this. This is the only movie in our yeah. retrospective that I have not seen. So this is will be um, the, the the Blu-ray came in today. If it wasn't yes. so late, I'd start it tonight. This this my Blu-ray actually has a whole bunch of uh, I think several special features in it. Actually, where hold on hold on hold on don't go anywhere. So you watch the movies on <laughs> Blu-ray. Well, well, the four, well, for 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 Noir November, I'm getting them all on Blu-ray because I want to collect these. Um, you guys, hold the foot down for a second. I might actually so do we, the same thing. We're watching Bo- Body Double, it's called, next week? I, I just... This, yeah. This, to confirm. Okay, cool. What year was yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to throw it in the chat. Um, Body Double is De Palma, Brian De Palma, and it is 1984. So we are slowly cranking through the 80s. I just can't wait for Black Rain. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited for that. Yeah, that's a good it's gonna one. going to be great. We're going to end on a, on a super cool note. Nice. Wow. All right. We got four featurettes, interviews with Brian De Palma, Melanie Griffith, and Greg Henry, Dennis Franz. Oh, cool. So I, cool. I am looking forward to this. I'm I'm really excited, happy that I am building up my Blu-ray collection. I, I don't have enough and I, I want to have more. So yeah. I'm doing the only the same. Blu-ray I wish- that I bought that I regret buying before seeing the movie was Cannonball Run because I thought it was going to be like this amazing oh Burt God. Reynolds film, and it was like they didn't. That's it was hilarious. just not good. Yeah. Do they still <laughs> my make proudest- Blu-ray machines? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I just, I, I just yeah. use it like play play them off my like PlayStation Four, but you know. Yeah. 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 I I have a bone to pick with Blu-ray cases. I think they need to upgrade them. If you're not yeah. in like a, if you're not in a sort of collector's uh, boutique Blu-ray, like Criterion, obviously they, those look like collector's items and, yeah. and sort of some of the Scream Factory stuff. But that big blue chunky bit at the top, man, that's got to go. We got to start getting some better cover art on our blues. I, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Any last words before we uh, close it out? No. No. This was fun. Well, that concludes our show for this week. We sincerely appreciate your listenership this week. As a final reminder, if you're enjoying what you hear, please consider leaving a rating and review. Your support truly brightens our day. The ideal platforms for this are Apple Podcasts or whichever platform you use to access our content. To stay updated, don't forget to subscribe to our monthly newsletter, Frame Rate Monthly, by sending an email to backtotheframerate at gmail.com. Back to the Frame Rate is a proud member of the Western Media Podcast Network. Stay connected with us on Facebook and Instagram and threads. You can find at Back to the Frame Rate. And of course, the most effective way to support us is by sharing our episodes on your social media feeds or platforms. <laughs> your support means the world to us. That's it. The show is over. Goodbye. I want you to know it's over. Well. Bye. This is where projects come to life. 
Our showrooms are designed to inspire with the latest products from top brands, curated in an inviting, hands-on environment, and a team of industry experts to support your project. We'll be there to make sure everything goes as planned, from product selection to delivery coordination. At Ferguson Bath, Kitchen, and Lighting Gallery, your project is our priority. Schedule your showroom consultation and see more from brands like Monogram at build.com slash Ferguson. This is where projects come to life. Our showrooms are designed to inspire with the latest products from top brands, curated in an inviting, hands-on environment, and a team of industry experts to support your project. We'll be there to make sure everything goes as planned, from product selection to delivery coordination. At Ferguson Bath, Kitchen, and Lighting Gallery, your project is our priority. Schedule your showroom consultation and see more from brands like Monogram at build.com slash Ferguson.